Maybe. Yes. <laughs> it's not magically working. It is. Yay. Also, if you need Wi-Fi, anything that has any SSID that starts with the word surf uh, is available to you. The password is 821-exchange. It's also on the wall. OK, so I'm Jeremy. And I'm glad that half of you are new this, this week, because I also did a short presentation last month. And so that means that everyone that's new here isn't sick of me talking to them already. So <laughs> that's good. I'm not planning on talking for two to three years. But what I'd like to do is do maybe a 20 to 30 minute presentation. I, I don't have too many slides. Uh, it's kind of a primer to unit testing in PHP. And then I have developed some exercises, some code that we can actually write PHP or write unit tests to. So uh, who has a laptop here with them that might be able to help as we split into groups to work on tests? Okay, so we have a few. <clears throat> How many people actually have PHP unit installed and working on their laptop already? Because it can be hard if you haven't done it before, especially if you're on Windows. I remember it being harder on Windows. I haven't actually developed in Windows in like a year and a half, so I'm starting to forget some of the. Yeah, it was a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I figured. Um, so uh, we will talk about unit testing mostly. I will mention other types of testing, some other things. Hopefully, you'll after the presentation's over, you'll have an idea of how unit testing works, why we do it, and have a whole bunch of other thoughts in your head that you want to go look up later. So, because I can't possibly teach you everything about unit testing, and I don't really consider myself an expert on the subject either. It's something I'm really interested in. Though. So hopefully, I can share what I've discovered in my experiences at uh, Amazon Web Services. Our library is actually unit tested with 95% and higher code coverage. So I've written a lot of tests for <laughs> the library. So I'm starting to get better at it. Uh, anyway, why don't we get started? So unit testing is kind of self-explanatory. You're testing units of code. It's a good name, I think. So testing individual units of code to determine basically if they work. That's why we do it. But what do we mean by units? So units are the smallest part of an application that you can test. So that includes functions, classes, and methods, basically. A uh, quote by Martin Fowler, who is a well-known computer scientist. Uh, Whenever you are tempted to type something into a print statement or a debugger expression, write it as a test instead. So how many of you have just like, oh, I need to make sure it works. Let me write a, cut up a little script really quick to double check. Yeah, well, unit tests are actually really good at doing that, too. So as you start to move into unit tests, you'll see the opportunities to kind of like, oh, well, Instead of just having a script that I'm going to either throw away or forget about, why don't I just make it a test into my application? So why do we test? Well, there's lots of different benefits. Um, first of all, when we do write unit tests in our code, we can find problems early, like op uh, optimally before we release in production. That's usually good to catch the bugs before we push it out. So writing tests helps us, helps us discover those. Uh, after we've already produced our code, it facilitates refactoring. So when you have a suite of unit tests in your code, when you make changes, you can be more confident in what you're doing because you can just rerun your entire test suite, and if something that you changed broke something, you'll know right away, and you'll know that you need to either update another part of your code or update the test to account for the changes that you made. It simplifies integration. So how many of you work on a team of more than you? OK. So how many times have you put code together with someone that you work with, and it didn't work as well as you were expecting? It happens, doesn't it? Even, you know, I think it even happens with yourself sometimes. <laughs> so the unit tests are designed to help us integrate our code better, because we each, uh, one second. If we each are writing unit tests with the code to produce we put together, we can run the entire combined test suite and know that the code that we both wrote fit together and work as expected. If it doesn't, then you know someone has to go back and fix something. Uh, what were you going to ask? 
Well, you mentioned in the step before about updating the test to reflect the changes. Mm -hmm. But do you ever run into a case where you update the test to reflect the changes and then it makes it so that you're testing in a way that doesn't actually catch what new thing you wrote? Definitely. Yeah, that happens. And unfortunately, uh, you you have to engineer your tests just as much as you engineer your code uh, because you're the one writing it and you can mis make mistakes in either way. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, another thing that unit tests and other tests are good at is uh, documenting the usage of the code that you're writing. So, so a lot of the times when you're writing code, you're not necessarily the one documenting the code or maybe you don't have time to. But if you've written unit tests that exercise that code, someone, another developer, or you, if you forget or you're coming back to it six months later, can look at the unit test and be like, oh, that's how you use it. OK, yeah, I remember this now. So it can help uh, in documentation indirectly. Also, you can, it can help you design better interfaces. So uh, there's two ways that I see that happening. Uh, one is you'll write some code. And then you go to write a test for it, and you'll be trying to write the test. You're like, wow, how do I test this? This like calls all sorts of classes all over the place, and I have no idea which part of my code is failing. So then you redesign your code, split things up into more module components that you can test separately, and thus create a better design your application. The other way is following uh, what's called test-driven development methodologies. I'm going to touch that on that just a tiny bit later, but I'm not going to go into too much detail there because that could be several presentations on its own. And an argument, too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. So uh, I sum the two major benefits up with unit testing with these two words, confidence and automation. You can have comp more confidence in your code when you have unit tested your code and, and you've exercised all the code that you've written and know that it works. And automation is the other key part. Uh, setting up, there's, there's lots of tools that can be used to run your tests automatically, uh, either at the click of a button or even on, uh, we'll talk about later with continuous integration. When you make a commit to your version control system, you can have some automated system pick up, run your changes automatically for you. So uh, there's lots of benefits to having this, but it comes down to being able to have confidence in the code that you're producing. So without any type of testing framework or anything, a unit test can be something simple like this. So if you have a function, add. I know that's a bit contrived, but it is what it is. We can create a test for add where we establish some test cases. and. Uh, then we can loop through them and use PHE's built-in assert function that will fail if this happens to not be true. So this to, and running this function test add with these numbers, where if we put A and B into the function, we're expecting C as a result. And if all those passes, then it gives us more confidence in our function add, which we should probably have a lot of confidence in anyway because it's pretty simple. But this is just an, uh, a very simple example. Now, if you were to do this for all your code, that would be a big mess of, of random test functions everywhere. So PHP the community has developed lots of different tools for helping you write tests in a way that's much easier to automate. And, and go ahead. It's not actually testing yet. Is it? Oh, yeah, you're right. Good call. <laughs> so I wrote this wrong. This should say. Add A B instead of adding A B. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to fix it. So some of the tools that we have available, uh, there are several testing frameworks. Actually, I shouldn't say several. I should say a few. Uh, the main one that you're going to see everywhere is PHP Unit, and we're going to talk a little bit about how to write those specific kinds of tests tonight. Uh, simple test is an older one, but similar. It's not maintained anymore as far as I've seen lately. So I would suggest staying away from that one unless you're just playing around. Uh, there's also PHPT. This is a, a simple framework. This is actually used by the, the developers of PHP to test PHP itself. 
And uh, but it, depending on what you're doing, it could be a good fit for for what you're trying to do. So uh, we're going to talk about mocking as well. But mocking is basically uh, creating fake versions of objects. And there's uh, several tools for that. Uh, PHP unit has this functionality baked in. Uh, I'll be the first one to say that I don't really like the interface they have for it. It's kind of confusing, but it works. So these two projects right here are other people who felt similarly and decided to create their own mocking libraries. But you can use these along with PHP unit. Uh, you don't have to use them separately. So uh, if you if you play around with mocks in PHP unit and decide you, you hate them, well, you could try out mockery or fake and see if your life was better. Uh, code coverage is another important part of unit tests. Uh, when, you're, when you run unit tests uh, with PHP unit, it actually will keep track of what lines of code it executes. So uh, using code coverage software, uh, these two usually ship with PHP, or code coverage usually ships with PHP unit. And xdebug is, of course, a PHP extension you can install that is actually required to do this. But you can uh, basically get metrics of what lines of code and how many times those lines of code have been executed when you run your tests. That gives you an idea of, hey, how much of my code am I actually testing? So those are good. Uh, that's good information to have. So for other types of testing, uh, besides unit testing, uh, there is uh, other tools like Behat, which is uh, geared towards functional and acceptance testing. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, or behavior-driven development, if you've heard that term before. Same with PHP spec, same domain, but uh, there's it's a different library. Uh, there's also Selenium. How many of you have heard of Selenium? I was talking to a couple of people before. So, I'm, I'll be the first one to say that I don't know a whole lot about it. I haven't used it much. But the purpose of Selenium is to test your user interfaces. And that includes being able to test JavaScripts. Uh, so that's something to look into if, you're, if your testing is focused on uh, testing like your website interface. You'll, you'll probably need a tool like that. That's really probably the only popular one I've seen that does that type of work. Can I ask a question really quick? Yep. I'm sorry, this is so basic, but I don't really understand what unit testing is compared to unit testing. So I'm going to talk about other types of testing here. <laughs> but, what, but I don't understand what unit testing is. So we're, we're going to write some tests, and we're going to go deeper into that. OK, OK. So hopefully Sorry. in like 10 or so minutes, we'll know more. Um, back when you were listing the tools, um, which one, which of them uh, had automation so that you could build something? Well, most of them are, are command line based tools, so you can essentially automate any of them uh, and work them into whatever system you want to use. So, so there are different types of testing. I don't know if any of you have a computer science background, but I remember these boards being thrown around in classes years back. Uh, but just to briefly go over these, so unit testing, we're testing individual units of code, so small things like classes, methods, functions, to make sure that for the inputs you get, you put in, you get the output that you expect. Uh, regression testing is a uh, step beyond unit testing. That's basically the automation of a full suite of unit tests, so that every time you change something, you can run your tests and make sure that there aren't any regressions. So those two kind of go together. Um, there's integration tests. And that's where you take separate units that you've tested with unit testing and now use them together. So instead of uh, mocking or using fake versions of objects that interact with each other, you actually use the objects. Or if you have a database or web service that you're using, you just go ahead and hit those like you normally would make sure that your, your code is actually doing what you think it's doing. Uh, mutation testing is kind of an interesting one. Uh, I've never actually done this in practice, but a mutation testing framework will actually take your unit tests and modify the code and try to run those unit tests. And you can find out some interesting things about your code that way. So like, 
if your unit test is modified to use a different value in one place, does your test still pass? If it does pass, is that a good or a bad thing? So there's interesting things you can learn from that. But like I said, I haven't done it in practice, so I don't know the full benefits there. So all these are, are grouped into what we call white box testing. And what that means is that when you're writing these kinds of tests, you, you actually know what the code is and how it works. So you're writing these tests based on your knowledge of the code. And usually the person who developed the code is also the person writing these tests, because they're the most familiar with it. Then there's a whole other category called black box testing, which is the opposite. You actually don't have to worry about what the internals of the code are. You just know what it's supposed to do, and you're testing according to that. So acceptance testing is, is the main one there. And that's basically feature level testing. So uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, the Agile methodologies, user stories, or if you organize things based on you know, business requirements or functional requirements, that's what you're testing. So you know, a user should be able to log in when they provide a username and password. So if they can do that, then your acceptance test is passed. And uh, there's, there are tools for automating that, and there's also, you can also do that type of thing manually, too. So, what tools uh, are available for um, automating acceptance tests? So I'm going to talk about that at the end. Uh, BHAT and PHP spec, which were on the previous slide, are both in that domain. And Selenium, too, because when you're testing a user interface, that's part of what you would define is, as your behaviors. So fuzz testing is an interesting one. That's uh, you basically running tests on a piece of code, but putting in things that you are hoping to break the code with. So, uh, you know. Oh, it's a division function. Well, I'll throw a zero or a null on there and see what happens. You're purposely trying to break the code that way. Or test like really weird edge cases. Uh, smoke testing, that's basically, hey, Ian, I just finished uh, this new part of the website. Do you want to log in and check it out and make sure it works? So when you deploy something, you have a couple of people do a little sanity check for you. That's, that's smoke testing. Not really something you ought to make, but. Uh, then performance testing. There's, there's different kinds of performance testing. So two of the ones that I hear most talk about are load testing and stress testing. So load testing is basically how much load can your code or your project application take. So you might, like, if, you're, if you had like a website, you, your load test might be trying to DDoS your own website to see if it can handle that load. Uh, stress testing is, is, is almost the same, but a little bit different. So stress testing is spikes in, in load. So whatever your normal load is, you want to, you want to hit it really hard with a, whole, a huge load at, in a small amount of time and see how your application handles that. So it's more, it's uh, basically testing the scalability and reliability of your applications. All right, so let's start talking about PHP unit. So PHP unit is what we call an X unit style library. So J unit, I believe, is the original one for Java. And a whole bunch of other languages have basically a port of JUnit, like NUnit for .NET, and in this case, PHPUnit for PHP. Uh, so it follows similar type of conventions. Uh, it's written by someone named Sebastian Bergman. Uh, I actually met him at ZenCon last year. He's kind of a he, he's a, a kind of a quiet guy with a really dry sense of humor. He's which uh, I think you would have to have a dry sense of humor to be working on unit testing a lot. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, the cool thing about PHP unit is that it's well integrated and well documented. So like every single tool related to developing in PHP usually has some way to integrate with PHP units. Um, and we'll, we'll show a few of those. Uh, it's also well documented. There's a, a whole user guide manual for PHP unit and it's got pretty much everything you need to know about how to use it in there. Uh, very easy to search through and whatnot. Uh, PHP unit is installable through Composer, Pair, and by a single FAR file that you can download. So there's 
few different ways that you can do it on your machine. For Windows users, I'm guessing the FAR file might be a good one to try first, if because uh, that could be easier than pair for sure on Windows. I remember pair being kind of a nightmare. Uh, so features of PHP unit. Uh, mocking, which is creating dummy or fake versions of objects. Uh, assertions, which is basically the main way you test things. You assert that this is equal to this, or this is true, or this key is in this array, or there's tons of different things that you can check. Uh, support setup and teardown functions. So you can write functions in your test class that will run at the beginning and at the end of every test. So if you have something that you need to set up the state of the thing that you're testing, you can do it that way. Uh, PHP unit makes use of annotations, which are basically in, located in the doc block above your, your uh, method. And there's just little codes that you can put in there that affect the way that your tests are run. And they're all documented in the PHP unit manual. Uh, PHP unit also has something called data providers, basically a, a function that, that returns an array of all of your test cases. And then you can tell your test to use that data provider. So you can, instead of writing a bunch of the same things over and over again, you just write one test and apply different data to it. Uh, it's also got code coverage features built into PHP unit. I mentioned that earlier. And uh, PHP unit has hooks into Selenium. Uh, so there's like a Selenium like base test class. So if, you have, if you're using Selenium, you can actually use PHP unit to drive those tests. And there's a bunch of other features. A lot. It's pretty robust. So what does a unit test look like? Well, before I sh actually show you one, I'm going to show you, to point out basic parts of it, there's the setup at the beginning, and uh, you set up the state of the thing you're testing. Uh, you can create fixtures. Fixtures is just a fancy word for objects that you're using or various things that you're using in your test. Uh, you prepare the state of the object, you execute the test, and you assert the outputs or the whatever is changed in the state of the thing you're testing, and then you can tear down uh, whatever it is you're working on. So what I want to do is actually show you some unit tests from the project that I work on, uh, the AWS SDK for PHP. Um, I show you the config file for PHP units, uh, run the, show you how to run the test, uh, look at the output, and show you what things mean there. Uh, I'm also going to show you how PHP unit integrates into the IDE I use. So I don't have to use the command line, but I can. Uh, look at the code coverage analysis. And then I'll show you some of the actual tests in the SDK. And then we're just going to go ahead and uh, update one of my tests. Because I, looked, I was looking at the code coverage today. I'm like, hey, this isn't covered. So we're going to do that and commit to my project right here. So this counts as work. For me. <laughs> All right, so oh, it's got this weird yeah, mirror here. Turn on the mirror. Here. That's what I want. All right, I need to sit down for this because I don't want to stand uh, the whole time encoding. Hope you don't mind. Let's, uh, so here's the, my project in my IDE. If you are curious as to where you can see this code, it is published on GitHub. And it's github slash aws slash aws hyphen sdk hyphen php. So if you want to check that out, you can. Okay, so we have a pretty complex configuration file for ours because we exclude a lot of uh, directories. Most of these are just exceptions. You don't really need to test exceptions because most of them just extend exception and don't have any code in them. So it's kind of pointless to, to make your code coverage analyzer go look at those for no reason. So that's what all that is. Uh, 
these are up here are general <coughs> options that you can apply to anything. Uh, basic config file doesn't even need that. Um, really, the most important part of this is identifying which folder I, I put the tests in. That's basically what PHP unit wants to know. So it knows you zoom way in on that? You're right. I'm sorry. I should have done that earlier. I can see it just fine. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So again, this is the general configuration. Uh, this is actually an important one, too. I have a bootstrap file here, so you can tell PHP unit to run a file at the beginning. So this basic, that file uh, sets up auto-loading for the whole project, so when I write my tests, I don't have to do any explicit required statements. It just knows where to find all the classes that it's been working with. Do you use the Composer? Uh, I do. For, in this project, we do use Composer, yes. And I really, really like Composer. Right, yeah. If you haven't tried Composer, you should. That's what, my what is Composer? Plug. So are, do you know what Pear is? Yeah. OK, so Pear is a dependency manager, package manager, but it installs everything globally to your system. Composer installs things to your project only. So you can actually install multiple versions of things into different projects. Um, it also not only manages your dependencies, but it creates auto loaders for you that you can just include that automatically load all the dependencies that you told it to download for you. Mm -hmm. And you can make them optimized. So instead of it having to search for the files, it just creates a hash map of everything. So when you say, oh, this file, it's like, oh, OK. Oh, yeah, a whole other topic. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, just look into it if you haven't. <laughs> uh, OK, I think we're, don't need to look at this anymore. In fact, I think question on, on that config. What? Not specifically, but when you when you're setting up PHP for your project, are you creating this uh, XML file manually, or can you have PHP unit generate an initial one for you? Or well, I'll be honest. I usually copy and paste, but so I don't know. It's, it might be possible. So when I ran my like when I just set this up the other night, like it did. I don't have like this. Uh, I, and I don't actually think you need it in every case. So, like, if your tests happen to live like alongside where PHP unit is, it can just find them. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have them in subfolders or you need some bootstrap file to make sure things are auto loaded, then that's when you would when you would need it. Okay. Good question. Okay. I'm in the right place. So with the, with the config file in place, I have all my options in that file. So I just need to run the PHP unit command. And it's going to start executing. So dots mean passed. You also, there's a couple of I's. Can you see this OK? Or do you see that more? OK. The I's mean incomplete. So I actually have two tests that I marked as, hey, I haven't done this yet. So that's not the ones we're actually going to do tonight, but I do need to go to them at some point. Uh, you can also see uh, F for failure, that's what you don't want, or E for error, that's what you really don't want. <laughs> that means PHP unit couldn't even finish writing the test because you put it in really bad. Uh, and then I think there's, oh, S for skip. So if uh, you have some test that has some precondition uh, that doesn't pass, you can just skip the test. So, a good example of that is if you have code that only runs conditional based off of whether or not you have a particular PHP extension enabled. So obviously, if you don't have it enabled, you shouldn't try running the test, or else you get E instead of what you want. <laughs> so yeah, we have 887 uh, tests in SDK. And didn't write them all in one day. <laughs> Uh, so we can also run this with code coverage. I oops, put this into a certain folder. That's, I'll use the wrong one. Ignore that stuff. It's not important. They're just uh, notices. 
So it takes a little bit longer when you're running with code coverage because it's doing a lot of recording what it's looking at. Then it generates reports. Uh, part of my uh, configuration file was also configuring some of the code coverage stuff, so that's why it was bigger. I can look at this in the browser. It produces different formats, so there's like XML formats and stuff that can consume by other programs. But you can also, I, the command I ran produces a HTML report, which is fit for humans. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you notice that there's green here. That's a good thing. Green is good. Uh, you can actually customize the thresholds of what color it shows. So, like, you can say <coughs> a class has at least 70% code coverage. Go ahead and show green. If it's you know, 50 to 70, show yellow. If it's below that, show red. You can change those thresholds depending on what your goals are in your project. It's not important to have 100% code coverage. In fact, you're going to spend a lot of time on tests if you want 100%. Usually, like, it's kind of one of those things where, like, the last 10% takes just as long as the first 90%. So that's something to keep in mind. Like, if you are, uh, it's kind of like school grades. Like, if you have 90%, if you have an A, and you don't have to worry about trying to get the rest, you already got the A. <laughs> uh, so, this basically prints out, uh, you can drill down into it. So the, the actual class that we're going to look at and update, I'll go ahead and zoom into that one. So here, in this class file. So this is looking at a particular class. So it shows, can you see this OK, or should I zoom? Uh, I can see the colors, but I can't see the words. Okay. So it shows uh, lines of code, and this is based off of each of the methods in your class. So well, most of these methods are covered fairly well, except for this one right here, this uh, get signing key method. That's the one we're gonna we're gonna fix in a minute here. Now, which of those kind of testings were each of these tests running? These are all unit tests. All. So we'll, we'll look at some here in just a minute. Okay. Um, then it also shows the code, actually, and it will highlight the lines that it, it checked and whether, like, and which ones did not get executed. So all the way down at the bottom here, we've got some red here. Those are the ones that we need to cover. And even if you mouse over here, it also gives you some more details, like about you know, which data sets crossed into the, this code. Um, does it say, yeah, it says how many tests. So this says that it got executed 38 times. So I guess that must be extra covered for that line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you also have to keep in mind that just because you've covered a line of code doesn't mean that it for sure works either. It's, it's only, an, you know, in addition to the other things you're doing, like, there's no guarantees ever, right? Because if you wrote the test wrong, then you might get a false positive. So, uh, like, like I said before, it, it takes just enough. It takes just as much engineering to write your test as it does to write the code. Why is it calling your code crap? Good question. I can't remember what that stands for. <laughs> it is. A, it is a play on words, if I remember right. But I can't remember. I'll have to double check that later. Would that be the, um, the complexity of it? Oh, here it is. Change risk anti-patterns index. <laughs> I'll be honest. I don't know what that is. So I'm definitely going to have to read that later. That's awesome. A good choice of words. <laughs> I like it. OK. Going back to my IDE, I told you that PHP unit integrates into my IDE. Uh, I actually have my project set up so that I can just hit and, and run my test right from within my IDE. And then uh, it also works. Different button up here at the top with code coverage. Kind of run the same thing here. And I believe this was working earlier. So, so 
Again, it takes a little bit longer when you're running with code coverage. There we go. Gives me a little side menu here that talks about my results. So 95% lines there, so that's still an A, even in my IDE, that's good. Uh, and I can also drill down into files here. So going to that same one, uh, and while it's a little bit fainter due to the way I have my my uh, IDE feed right now, it actually shows a faint green and red marks here on the line number. So even with it in my IDE, I can see which of the lines were executed and which weren't. So kind of handy tools like that. So, let's see, I wanted to show you a couple tests here. Let me find the code I want. Good? Good yeah. size? In the back? Uh, this is a test for a class called chunk hash. So PHP has functions for hashing, like streaming chunks of data. And this is basically just a wrapper for those functions because there was a common pattern that we saw, and one that we implemented purely on our own and one that PHP had. So we could put them all to the same interface. Uh, so each of the methods that start with Okay, well, let's look at the whole thing. So um, my tests implement or extend this one, which extends this one. So this is the uh, oh, not go all the way in there. Uh, PHP framework test case is the class, but that's what your unit tests are going to extend for PHP unit framework to pick them up. And we added some conveniences in a layer on top of that, so you can extend and put things in there. Tests are just like your other code. You can add things to uh, make it easier on yourself. You can use, like I said, you can you, just as much engineering can go into your tests as your code. You still don't want to repeat yourself when you're writing tests or code. So uh, you can make it as easy or hard on yourself as you want to. Uh, so here's an example of the annotations here in PHP. So uh, this one here on the top of the class, covers, in PHP unit, that's, that's for the code coverage. So I can explicitly say, when you run lines of this code, even if it runs code from other classes, I still only want you to count the ones in this class. So you can limit the scope of what your tests are covering for your code coverage. You can do that on the class itself or on individual methods. Uh, this annotation is called expected exception, and so uh, my test is named test throws exception for invalid algorithm. It's a good idea when you're running tests to actually say what you're testing instead of just saying test method name because you're like, what am I testing about this method? What if this method has multiple code paths? Which code paths am I te testing? So it's better to test exactly the intention, name it to be exactly the intention of what you're doing. So this test is pretty simple. I'm doing some substantiation in the class, but you know I know that if I pass in this value, it's going to throw an exception. So I declare that here in this annotation. Like, so if this exception is thrown, then this test is passing. So that's the expected behavior when I give it our invalid value. Uh, here's an assert statement. So PHP's assert library. There's lots of different things. The most basic one is assert true. So you can put in whatever condition you want in there. Uh, here's another assert equals, so you pass in two values, if they're the same, then it passes. And so if, if any is, you can have more than one assert statement in a test, but if any one of them fails, the test fails. So it'll, it, if this first one fails, it stops there in that test and just says that one failed. Can you have it tell you which assert? 
It, it, yeah, it'll tell you uh, like what line number that uh, a search statement failed on, so you know where to look. Uh, otherwise, it'd be a little hard to track down in that chart dots. And that. Right. So it, it actually prints out information. I believe the, a lot of the assert functions, there's a, another parameter you can pass them, such as you want to a verbose message. Yes. And then it'll output that message on the command line as well. Yeah, I believe the last argument in any assert function, you can put in a message there. So where it fails out, you can say, hey, look at me. Uh, this is what went wrong, because you planned ahead for that. <laughs> uh, so this is a pretty basic test. These tests aren't very long. Um, I'll show you an example of one that was really, really hard to write, <laughs> just for fun. Uh, let's see. So just to give you some uh, context on this one, uh, AWS has a service called Simple Notification Service, which can send ma uh, messages from one server to another, or to email, to a f uh, SMS message. So if, but if you're passing messages from one application to another, you'll basically send an HTTP request, or SN, the SNS service will send an HTTP request to your application. But you need to figure out where that uh, that message came from. Did it actually originate from the SNS service, or did, was it from someone else? So uh, the message comes with a signature, a digital signature and a URL to the certificate that was used. And then you can use that information using the PHP OpenSSL extension to reconstruct the signature on your end based on the data in the message and the certification provided. Sign that and, and match the signatures to verify that it did come from the Amazon SNS service. So as you can imagine, with all the OpenSSL stuff, this could be pretty hard one to write a test for. <laughs> and it was. It took me several hours. But when I was done, I felt like so happy with myself. I learned a lot about the OpenSSL extension. And the test itself uh, is basically the wrong direction. Too big. OK, so this. Uh, this message test validate succeeds when message is valid. So I create a, the message object with some dummy data, and then I need to get the signature, and then uh, basically use the validator object, which is the object I'm testing, to also try and match that signature if it's correct. So. I was able to figure out how to generate a dummy set of data to create a signature with the open SSL functions. I had to do a lot of reading in the PHP manual to, to figure that stuff out. So sometimes you can get some pretty hairy tests, but most of the time they're not like this. So going to the one that we're going to edit right now, this is a signing class itself. So when the S when using the AWS SDK, uh, you have to sign your requests to AWS with your credentials. You have a basically a public and a private key type thing. Um, so this is the test for that. But we are going to fix this part right here, which uh, you probably can't see the red on the left, but these are the lines that weren't covered in my code coverage. Make a bigger one. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's a good right. So that's the that's the code we're going to test. So let me open up the test for that. Oh, very. Okay, so the interesting thing about the signing algorithm here is that it uh, it does several HMAC hashes using your your uh, private key. So it layers information uh, about your request, uh, 
uh, and hashes it so that to produce the signature that's sent to AWS. And it keeps a cache of values that you've signed before so that you don't have to waste time signing those again. If, because like when you're sending to a particular endpoint, uh, it's going to be the same service name every time. So it, cache, hash, it caches the value that you signed with that particular part of the signature. So this test is testing that that cache is indeed happening. But what we, what was not tested was what happens when the cache gets too large. So this function uh, signature max set max cache size to eight. That's saying only keep a full cache size of eight. That's set for this test in particular. When you actually use it, it's like a hundred or, or more. You know because however concerned you are with memory. Uh, I'm going to actually change this to a lower value so we can exercise the code that gets executed when we over, go over that amount. So we have recruit, we've done we're basically signing one request, so it's caching values for this one, another one, a third one. So by this time, our cache is full, so now I'll just add one more to uh, overflow the cache. And we're asserting on equals on the size of the cache. So it's getting uh, the hash cache and doing count, and then we're asserting that it's a certain amount. So after it overflows, it's going to erase everything, put the new value in. So it should be one if uh, we coded it correctly. Oops. First few hot corners. And uh, I also want to make sure. So this uh, is using the covers annotations marked here. One of the problems why this method isn't getting, why the original method isn't getting covered as well is that uh, it's not actually explicitly called out there. So we're going to make sure that that's there for us. So now, I should be able to run my code coverage again. And we'll check the report and see if that method's covered. So this, this was looking at some existing tests, but uh, soon we're going to break up and actually write some new tests from scratch so we can practice that. OK, uh, upon refreshing this, I don't see a change. So apparently, we didn't get it. What happened? Sign key is covered. Oh, well, that's no fun. Okay, well, I was hoping that was going to work. But I don't really want to waste the time debugging this. So let's just go ahead and continue on. All right. So uh, just to talk about some best practices here. Uh, it's best to try and test one unit at a time. So when you're writing a test, you should be testing like a single method or function, not trying to test like the whole class in one go, unless that really, really makes sense. So I sometimes break this rule if I have like a bunch of trivial getter and setter functions, I just kind of put them all together. Use your best judgment there. 
But your whole goal is to test units and to know that when one test fails, you know exactly what part of the code you need to fix that correlates with it. Uh, each test should try to be independent. So there are ways in PHP unit where you can have one test depend on the result of another. That's generally not what you want to do because each method should work independently of another method in your class. So uh, that's kind of the goal you want to have. Uh, so when you're dealing with methods or classes that depend on other classes, you want to mock or stub out those classes so that you're not interacting with the other part. Because if, you're, if, you use, if one class uses another and you use that other class directly, when you run the test and your test fails, it's hard to know whether the failure happened in the class you were trying to test or the class that was being used by the class that you were testing. So you want to try and reduce the usage of outside things. And especially with things like databases and third-party services, you want to unlock those as well. And PHP actually has tools uh, for helping you do that with databases. I'm not really going to go into that because that could be its own presentation too. Uh, but it's something you'll most definitely come across. Uh, I already talked about this one, that you should try to name your tests after what their intended purpose is. Uh, so be specific and about which code path that you're following in your code for that test. Uh, I said earlier that your test, you should engineer your tests just as much as your code. So you should be using good practices when you write your tests. And try. If you find yourself writing the same snippets of code in every test, well, you can probably refactor that out into some private method used by your tests. So that would make more sense. And another aspect about unit testing is writing your code to be testable. There's a whole set of principles around that that could be a separate presentation. Uh, just to give you a taste of what one of those things is, is a concept called dependency injection. Is anyone familiar with that term? OK, a little bit. So basically what dependency injection means is it's a pattern, a sign pattern, where components are given their dependencies through their constructors and methods or you know, setting on fields, as opposed to the class instantiating its dependency itself. So the problem is when you want to mock a dependency, if the class that you're testing instantiates that class inside of it, there's no way that you can give it a different mock object. So you're stuck using <coughs> that other class. And then when you, you write your unit test, you're testing more than one unit at a time. So either you need to refactor your code or just take a hit on that you didn't do a very good job designing that component. <laughs> uh, an example of dependency injection, pretty trivial. If I had like a class that sends emails, I might have different drivers for sending emails, whether it's uh, using the mail function in PHP or maybe using the MailChimp API or the Amazon SES API. So I might have an interface for that driver. We'll call it transport interface. And I have multiple implementations. So when I instantiate my mailer object, I'm going to tell it which driver I want it to use. Instead of having, and, and, and another common thing a lot of people do might, might you pass in a string, like the name of it, and have the class inside instantiate it. But again, you get the problem when you're testing that code is there's probably not a string code that turns into mock object of that. So being able to explicitly pass in the object, you can create a stub or mock object, pass it in, that when you are testing your mail class, you're not also actually testing the ability to send a mail. You're just testing what the mail class does. So uh, definitely like look up dependency injection and read more about it, because while it's actually a fairly simple concept, it tends to be one that's hard to explain. So. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, continuous integration. So continuous integration is a concept of integrating your code amongst your team often and automating the processes that you use for building and testing your code. So our unit tests play an important part of that. Uh, so every time, when you have a continuous integration system set up, 
every time that someone pushes to the central repository, uh, the test can be run automatically by the system and basically say, hey, the commit that you just pushed up, it, it was bad. You need to, we're, we're taking that back, rolling back, and you need to fix your code and try again. Or everything passes and yay, and you could just say, well, all right, if it passed, why don't you just go ahead and push that up to my staging environment and deploy it for me. So continuous integration systems are a way to kind of automate all of those processes and put it together. Now, they're usually not trivial to set up. It's going to take some work. These are the five most popular ones for PHP. Uh, there's Jenkins CI, which used to be called Hudson, if you've heard either of those. Um, Sebastian Bergman, the guy who wrote PHP Unit, has like templates for Jenkins CI that integrate other PHP tools, so that's something to look into. Um, there's also uh, a new thing called Travis CI, which isn't PHP specific, but it's actually a hosted continuous integration system, uh, mostly geared towards open source projects. Uh, and it does a lot of cool things. It has integrations with stuff like GitHub. Uh, there's also Zinc, PHP under control, and Bamboo, which is a, an Atlassian project or a product like Jira. Uh, also not PHP specific, but uh, I've seen it used commonly by PHP developers. So, uh, sure. You know if any of those work outside of GitHub? Or oh yeah. No, no, uh, this is probably the only one that's Git. Okay. Specific. Okay. The rest can uh, have plugins for Subversion, CVS, Mercurial, Git, uh, pretty much everything. You said some words I didn't recognize. Sure. It sounded like Atlassian and Jira. Atlassian, I think, is how you pronounce it. Jira is another one of their Jira. products. It's like an issue tracker type thing. They have a whole suite of products. Bamboo is one of theirs. So they're, they're, uh, Atlassian is the company. So if you're looking into continuous integration for PHP, okay. I'm, I'm going to say these are probably your only options that are good. <laughs> so I've got a question. You've been doing all of this, uh, all of this unit testing. You haven't been doing any integration tests. Right. So as you get through, you're ready to commit. You throw it up on Jenkins, for instance. It goes through. It reruns your, your suite of uh, unit test, yep. along with anything else that it needs to that's been checked in. But now, don't you need to actually stop and run integration tests? Yeah, like uh, is, you haven't broken something because yeah, yeah, you've tested everything as an individual object, but you haven't tested the interface back and forth. Yeah, definitely. Uh, most, uh, I would uh, be doing both of those suites of tests on your continuous integration server. Okay. So, uh, integration testing just kind of outside of the scope of what I wanted to talk about tonight. So, well, that was the other thing I was going to mention. Then, again, you've been talking about all of the, all of your unit tests. Yeah. I keep having this habit of wanting to go through and do the integration <laughs> testing. Yeah. Time. There's 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 yeah there's more to testing than just unit tests. So. Okay. Uh, some other cool tools that uh, PHP has. There's a uh, these are all very acronym like. But uh, PHP MD is mess detector. It uh, it looks for like when you have like crazy long classes or methods and stuff, and says, "Hey, you know, you have a method that's like 200 lines long. You might want to consider refactoring that." <laughs> uh, PHP copy and paste detector. So this will actually look for hunks of code that's the same in various places and say, "Hey, do you mean to write this more than once? You might want to put that in its own." object or something. Then a PHP code sniffer. Uh, you can define sets of standards of what your what you want your code to look like. There's some prepackaged ones like for uh, Zen for pair standards for the uh, uh, PHP fig PSR standards if you've heard of those. Uh, and you can so that way you can uh, try and force some consistency on the way your code looks in your project. Uh, and those are all these tools and some more are you can find at phpqatools.org, uh, along with more information about PHP Unit. So uh, going back to Travis, uh, I've been playing around with that a lot this past year with GitHub. One of the cool things it does is uh, if you're familiar with the GitHub workflow, you, uh, someone can fork your code, create a pull request, uh, or update something and create a pull request and say, hey, I took your project, I made some changes, 
this is what I changed. Do you want it? And if you have Travis CI hooked up to your GitHub project, Travis CI will actually go ahead and run the tests for you once it gets the pull request. And it will show up right here on the pull request and say, hey, the test passed. So you can probably merge this uh, without worrying too much about it. Or if, you, you know, if it comes back red, then you're like, hey, I don't know about this one. <laughs> so there's some cool integration points with uh, Travis CI and GitHub, yeah, especially for open source type projects. Uh, also, quickly to touch on test-driven development and be, uh, behavior-driven development. Uh, those are both kind of beyond the scope of this too, but just to give you an introduction. So in test-driven development, the philosophy is that you actually write your tests before you, write the, before you implement the code. Because ideally, you want, to, you want to know what your code is supposed to do before you write it. And this kind of forces you to do it that way. So you write a test that executes, or that would execute the non-existing code the way that you want it to work. And then you, you run the test. Of course, they fail because there's no code. And then you go and fit, write the code for it and run your tests and see if it passes. And you can iterate over that until it actually works the way that you designed it to work with your tests. Um, so it's very common in. Uh, agile practices. I personally have mixed feelings about it because I think it's not necessarily a good fit for every project or every person, but it's definitely something you shouldn't rule out. Uh, it's worth like, trying out on your team if you, if you think it would help. Um, Behavior-driven development is taking, is, is kind of an extension of test-driven development. Instead of focusing on unit tests and designing your code, you're actually more focused at the feature level. So what are the business requirements? And there are tools like vHat and PHP Spec, which uh, actually uh, have a syntax where you write out things in a uh, kind of an English like description of a feature, which is able to hook into uh, this, the test framework and execute various uh, chunks of code so that uh, you have these descriptions that people who are not uh, developers or engineers can read and verify or even write, and then the engineers write the, the code behind it that actually executes those statements and runs the test. So it's, a, it's an interesting way to look at it as well. And again, it's going to be based on what you're doing or your team, whether or not this is a good fit for the project you're working on. Definitely things checking checking out and looking more into. Um, I'll, I'll put these slides on the meetup group emailing list, but there are some great people to follow if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about unit testing or testing in general. These are all people that are way more knowledgeable on the subject than I am. So um, that's, that's all. So I have two questions. Um, one, I'm, I'm a total novice when it comes to PHP, but in developing for a couple of decades, and traditionally what I do is I have, put, I have a debug mode, and I can read the code and I can see what's being tested. Mm -hmm. How can you tell that everything has been um, tested when you're looking at your, oh, if you're a complicated project? Is there any a, way that you can a large test question. that every single line has been right. tested? And I don't know if this is part of the same question or different question, but how do you test for um, different states? Um, of the environment. So when, when, you, uh, when you're running unit tests, uh, I showed you how you can do the code coverage analysis. So you can actually make sure every line has been executed in your test. Uh, and it's really the way that you write your test which determines, uh, I mean, you write your test to, f to basically tell you a certain aspect of what you want to know about your code. So for as much things as you want to know about your code, you can write tests to cover those areas. But um, it's, you can it's you can also enable possible. like debugging mode when you run your test too, so that you can output things too. Let's say it's pretty impossible to um, beginning of any complex project to one hundred percent accurately anticipate every issue. That's oh, there. definitely, yeah. And so um, that's why it's good. I I find it good when actually reading the code. So I can, if, when it's in debug, I can see mm -hmm. when I've got the debug version of it, you know, that it gets cleaned up. Yeah, there's definitely nothing wrong with that. 
But can you do that if using this approach where you're calling external functions to look at to run through the code to look and see what's being done? Can you can you look and see that uh, when you're reading your code that it's being that you know that, that you've written something that's calling it? I mean, I know you can do a you can test for a line, but there are multiple like if you've got case statements and mm -hmm. statements and branches and stuff. Is there a way that you can test that that's working that you put in the proper tests? That's being tested properly when you're looking at the code, or I, how, do you, how do you how do you manage the overall project for complicated processes? Well, uh, for for me, processes. it's like it just it's one piece at a time, and and you know, we talked about how there's multiple kinds of testing, so you, you kind of layer those on top of each other. Like just unit tests aren't going to solve all your problems. You need integration tests. You need you might need acceptance tests. You might need selenium tests. It, it depends on the project. Were you saying though that your the IDE you're using can you can watch you can you can debug you can go into debug mode while it's doing the feature unit testing? Well, I mean, it's it's actually your code. If you have some sort of switch for running debugging, you can still have that on when you're running your tests. Is that xdebug in PHP Storm? Xdebug? Is, is that what we're looking at? I never uh, use PHP Storm. Oh, uh, it's it's using xdebug in the background to track the, the executions. Yeah. Xdebug is a, a, an Eclipse implementation. That's a no. It's a, a, just a PHP extension. So like it's oh. it's it's PHP like you can install on your server PHP like through Peckle or Parity. Oh. Oh, but to answer your question, you mentioned you might have a, a switch statement. And you want to make sure that every right. every case is addressed. His example actually showed that he had an if statement. And it was the two lines inside if statement that were not executed during any of his tests. So as a result of that, he would go back to his test and make sure that he has a condition that would execute that code that's inside if statement. So if you had a switch statement, you would just need to add more tests to make sure that each one of them, and the code coverage will tell you that. It'll show you, well, these lines never got executed. I mean, regardless of whether you're using tests or just looking at output, it's still a, it's still up to you to make sure it's covered. But the test can give you an automated way to do that going forward. And then, how do you handle um, where you want it? Where you're looking at a state situation, like maybe a file that you expect to see isn't there, or there's something in the environment that is dynamic and it should be there, but for some reason it isn't. So there's. And so yeah, the to unit tests uh, you can have like setup and teardown functions at the beginning of each test. So like if there's something that needs to be created, you can have it created in the setup function and then removed again in teardown. So that you you basically are responsible for putting the system that's being tested into the state okay. to test. Uh, so there's there's lots of different techniques to do that as well. Has anybody ever tried? Uh, Deploying a unit testing on a code base that is entirely not object oriented. It's not easy. <laughs> one time I gave myself a root canal. <laughs> <laughs> now if you if you are starting from a like like legacy type code system, you're not going to be able to transform it all in a single day. You most likely most likely are going to be taking it like module by module when you are adding tests in. So. And something I've never seen is somebody actually creating unit tests for just like a goal function. And you can do that because I mean, the, you still write a test class, but you can call whatever you want in that test. It doesn't have to be another object; it can just be a function. So you can definitely do it. And then you could just call the name the test class after like whatever group of functions you're testing. I'm curious if you do unit testing on Google. They do. I don't think. I think they might have their own uh, uh, testing framework for that. At least right now, in Drupal eight, I believe they're going to be using PHP unit. So it's already pretty late, and I wanted to actually have some time for people to write in the test. So I have some classes that I wrote that we can write in the test for. If uh, you guys are game for that. So. It's up to you. Well, what do you think? Sort of how how simple are they? <laughs> like, oh, can I just type them in real quick? Into my ID. And I have. Try. They're up on uh, GitHub organization that I created for. 
her meat account. So, um, if you want to take a look at it, then right here. So, uh, yeah. If you want to, if you want to stay and work on it now, then I'll stick around and and uh, help. But it doesn't have to be something very structured. So, so how many of you guys have? Written unit tests in PHP. Okay. Um, what if we do this? And I'm asking a question, by the way, which is awkward to do in public. Um, we're going to have a private conversation here for just a minute. You're more than welcome to listen. <laughs> um, can you walk us through a, just a very simple, from scratch, setting up a unit test and running it on? Even, I mean, is, I'm assuming that math is pretty. Yeah. Well, do that. That's a good idea. So here's, because here's, here's when, actually, you're kind of those, you want to watch, uh, those who want to watch, those who want to watch, create a test track, like me. Um, what does that have to do with anything real quick? And then if, you, if that's not of interest to you, you can mill that and meet other folks and stuff like that. Does that sound all right? Wow, they actually get feedback. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that was I keep mocking them, but I went to it. I went to a, I've been to a couple things that involve the Java language, which I don't use. Um, and they're just like rude or quiet, which I think is rude. Uh, so, <laughs> so thank you for nodding your head. Um, cool. So if you want to watch Jeremy do the factorial uh, right. unit test, go that way. And if you don't care, stay on the nice sofa in this uh, chat. <laughs> There's a fridge over there with other people's stuff in it. You're free to. No, don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So, why don't you, if you want to watch a test be created, uh, grab a chair and move that way. And if you're not interested, go that way. Okay. So, yeah, let's go ahead and do this one. Uh, the other classes, I can just first leave it up to you as an exercise on your own if you want to, and you can ask me questions about it if you decide to work on it. Uh, but I wrote this function. Uh, for uh, what we're gonna move. Oh, okay, yeah, come on. I wrote this particular function to to show how you can exercise multiple code paths and also handle the exception throwing. So I thought it'd be a good one to. Okay. Sorry. I'm gonna block it. Bye, Greg.